Jacques Attali, thank you very much indeed. Let me remind you what he said, the end of mankind is most certain. But we're going to address what's going to happen before that dreadful moment happens, where we're all going to live, in cities, most of us. The scale of the challenges, not just here in the kingdom, but right around the world, particularly legacy cities as well. The title is technically Designing Cities for 2122. That's 100 years from now. Think of where we were 100 years ago. But we've still got to cope with the cities we have at the moment and the extraordinary expansion and the pressures that are building in many parts of the world. And in 35 minutes, that's what we want to analyze with our expertise here on the platform. Uh, remember what was in John Defteros's uh, session before that about the durability of people and the danger of things being destroyed literally in two or three months. But yeah. what I want to focus on in initially yeah. is, first of all, understanding the scale of the problem. And we want to get to a point where you can have an idea about how we're going to cope with huge numbers of people who expect to somehow live in cities, even though the cities are not built to cope with them. But I'm going to go through all the, all the guests immediately to get their projections about what is going to happen and also to describe what they do as well. Laurent Germain, you're the CEO of the Aegis Group. What is your, first of all, what does Aegis do? And secondly, briefly, your projections of the numbers we have to consider. Thank you, Nick. Uh, so Aegis Group is the French leader for engineering and uh, O&M for infrastructure. It's uh, uh, 18,000 uh, people and 1.5 billion euros uh, company. Uh, when we think about the cities uh, in a hundred years time, so what will be the most populated cities? Not the ones that we know today. Uh, the three main popula most populated cities will be Lagos, 88 million inhabitants. Um, second will be Kinshasa, 83 million inhabitants. Third will be Dar es Salaam, 73 million inhabitants. So the scale and the size of the cities will have nothing to do with the cities we, are, we know today. So the, and two of these cities are coastal cities with a lot of issues uh, with flooding and a lot of risks for the inhabitants of the city. So the, the role that we have, the responsibility that we have is to do the urban planning now so that we can welcome the millions and millions of people which will go into the cities, which uh, uh, leads us to introduce the concept of resilience. Resilience should be at the heart of the decisions we, ta we, we take today in order to protect humanity uh, uh, tomorrow and the engineers they have the means to do that. The engineers, they know how to plan and how to design infrastructure which will be more resilient uh, in, uh, in the next years than they right. were today. Pause for the moment. Barry, can I come to you? Barry Sternlich, who's co-founder and chairperson and CEO of Starwood Capital. What are you projecting? <laughs> I'm trying to figure out what's happening next weekend, not 2020, 21-22. Um, I'm Barry Sternlich, I'm chairman of Starwood, Hotel, Starwood Capital Group. Um, and, and, and uh, created Starwood Hotels in my youth. Uh, we run around $130 billion in assets in every asset class in real estate or in multis, office, hotels, residential. I think when you look at the mistakes of the current large cities that grew without planning, whether it's Mexico City or some of the other um, Asian cities that just grew and grew and grew, there's an imperative now to think about the city of the future, which includes green areas and making them habitable for people. I think otherwise people will leave the urban core and they will go, they'll, you'll have a sprawling development. So obviously that puts enormous energy and thought into infrastructure, mass transit. What does mass transit look like in the future? It's probably above grade, it's probably fast. And I think the planning, the planning for these cities, uh, you, you, you here are, are building the a city for 50,000 people in Derrida Gate, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing accomplishment because you've got the wide boulevards, the cultural institutions. The city should last easily 100, 200, 300 years because it's well master planned. Most cities didn't develop that way. Mm -hmm. Cities just grew, Dallas to Plano, Texas to other, and it just grew and is sprawling. But I think if a city, the urban core, Today has to be redesigned, but in the future, it has to be much more planned and, and uh, um, open to the res They know what the plan is so that they right. build within the overall plan of the cities. But in the 30 minutes we've all got, let me just emphasize to you, you need to think about how we cope with the cities we have already. That's why I asked 
for Laurent to give us the details for big cities. They are going to be the big cities of the future. Yep. How do we handle this? Uh, Mohamed Alibar, uh, we know your development massively uh, uh, around many regions of the world. What is your expectation about how you redesign cities for 21, 22? I'm tempted to say that's only five hours from now, but you know what I mean. In other words, there is an urgency which is far greater than just 100 years from now. Sure. Uh, well, the, the reality is that uh, I think human beings are so capable, Nick, uh, that if you've got a willing private sector that's really responsible and cares, and, and, and you've got a, a willing authorities as well, but on top of that, I think you, have a glo you need a global authority. Because when we speak about Nigeria, and I know Nigeria well, uh, well and Tanzania, is that it, to solve such 80 million population of a city and how to sort out infrastructure, how to start now, how to plan it, how to, how to fund it as we spoke. I, I think the whole world have to collaborate because this is, a, this is a matter, I know we're very polite, but you know, <laughs> immigration of 80 million people on the coastline to, to the world. I mean, how would you deal with that? So I think it's, it calls for all of us to collaborate. I know we are in the private sector, we are driven by profit and loss, but there's so much more important things to do. Now, let's come back to your reality and let's look at Saudi Arabia. I think there's a lot of people in the audience who are, and somebody with us here, uh, who are really designing right now and constructing massive towns for the future. They are implementing the, their we'll greatest David technologies. But, but, but uh, let, me, let me tell you something really funny. Uh, you know, I have a special AI that I put a question and I say, give me my speech. And I told, and I put, the, I put in the AI, uh, cities after 100 years, and there came one line, good Wi-Fi. Good Wi-Fi? <laughs> good Wi-Fi. <laughs> Why? Because I think everything will be driven by technology. Everything will be driven by technology. I think we are, as human beings, we have a, a, a massive risk, but I really think we're capable but we should do, private sector should do, I mean, all of our plan, you've seen our <coughs> Serbia or in Saudi Arabia or in Dubai, we, we are starting to plan for tomorrow and, and you know the elements, but we also need the, the, the public sector to come and facilitate and sometimes put pressure all on right, us. All right, well, let's build on that in a moment if we can, Mohammed. Let me go to the other end to uh, Hakan Ilmaz, who is Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for Carrier Global. You are involved in healthy, safe and sustainable building and cold chain solutions. The enormity of what we've heard from Laurent, the scale of what we're, we're facing, how do you judge it uh, from Carrier Global? The way we see the future is um, we're continuously innovating new solutions, right? I worked as CTO in different segments, in automotive, aerospace, now in building technologies and cold chain. The overarching technology transformations are very similar, autonomy, electrification, connectivity, sustainability, these are across the board. And the underlying enabling technology building blocks that are enabling for um, these transformations, AI, cybersecurity, differentiated electronics, these are happening in all industries, affecting how we design the future living spaces, cities, and two things are happening. One, any innovation in any segment is not contained in that segment anymore. If you have a new electronic solution, it flows from automotive into aerospace to buildings to cold chain. If you invent an AI solution on the cloud, it flows into other segments. It is happening at a very rapid scale. And number two, techno I'm a technologist. And what I've seen so far is technology is not enough. Customer, the user expectation has to be there for innovation to be ignited in, space, in, 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 in domain. What is invented today is really setting the foundation for tomorrow. We did not have iPhones or smartphones 20 years ago or electric cars 20 years ago. Now we have them. And that is the norm for the new generation. What is invented yesterday is the norm today. What we are inventing today will be the norm tomorrow. So you have, you, you have equal confidence to Mohammed what, saying what he was saying, that we will find the way forward. Yes. All right, let me, I'm going to go through you all, all very quickly at the moment. And by the way, I apologize there are no women on the panel because of course women are going to be occupying half of the city. <laughs> so apologies for that. Um, let me move Im immediately, first of all, to, uh, to David Grover. Now, David, you are working here in Saudi Arabia for uh, your chief executive of Roshan. Um, what are you developing here? Because in many ways, you have the perfect, ideal, 
potential because of the nature of the, country, the nation, the nature of the topography, the nature of the early stages of building which can be created, unlike many legacy cities around the world, <coughs> facing these enormous bottlenecks on everything. Yeah, we do, and uh, thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, maybe I'll just start with something which is a bit of a, a mindset or reset, which is if we're developing communities for 100 years' time, it's sad to say probably none of us will be in the, in the room here today will actually be part of that future. It's a long way away. So we have an obligation, we certainly have an obligation in Roshan to, to make the uh, resilient long-term planning in terms of what we're doing in the cities, that they can be robust and last that long. So that's probably a, a good starting point. In terms of uh, Roshan is a Saudi, many of uh, the guests here will know Roshan is a Saudi-based public investment fund real estate developer. We're developing across the kingdom at the moment on a, on a super large scale. So that, that actually puts quite a burden on us in terms of or accountability in the right way to make sure we design well, we think well, we plan well, we create resilient communities long term, IT connectivity absolutely essential, and, and also create buildings that can adapt and change over time as the population changes as well. So I think that, that's, a, that's a key part. We're looking at um, design in terms of um, being efficient in the way that perhaps buildings have not been in the past. So we're already producing designs 20% more efficient than Saudi building code. So we're driving energy conservation, we're um, driving tech into homes so that actually they can be controlled and monitored remotely because we think that'll, that'll add some long-term benefit. And then if you look at each of our communities across the kingdom, most of them will ho house between 250 and 300,000 people in every location, each location around the country. So we're talking about affecting the lives in a positive way of maybe three or more million people over the next five to seven years. Uh, that, that clearly gives us a big responsibility and we, and we need to think carefully about what we're doing because otherwise we're not leaving the right legacy and, we, and these buildings need to, need to survive. We don't want to be demolishing these buildings in 10, 15 years time. I mean, we, the reason I'm, I'm asking you at this stage in our discussion is because in many ways you have the ideal potential and ideal opportunity compared to the kind of numbers that Laurent has given us for uh, Kinshasa, Lagos and Dar es Salaam, mm -hmm. where this kind of thing simply can't be built. Money, design, everything else. But the final thing I want to do before we open it up even further is go to Jean Tote, because Jean, you are UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for Road Safety. And I'd like to ask you, given the large number of people who are killed in mobility accidents on four wheels or two wheels, where you think we will be when it comes to mobility in cities, and therefore what cities have to plan for, is personal mobility using vehicles or, um, or other devices, is that going to be central still to a city? I mean, absolutely it's central. And I mean, just to give you some figures, Every year, 700,000 people die on the cities because of road crashes. And you have about 20 million who are injured with disability. And uh, you are talking about uh, cars, drivers, passengers, motorbikes, but you have also pedestrians. Both uh, in the developing world, 40% of those figures are pedestrian. And now in the cities and everybody is, uh, I mean, leaving that, you have new way of mobility. You have electric bicycle, you have e-scooter. So clearly that's a threat. And uh, by 2050, you will have 75% of the population living of the cities. So when you speak about designing cities for the future, it's absolutely essential to speak how people are going to move, to go from one place, to come to work, to come back home. So that is absolutely essential to link the road traffic to the design of the cities. And incidentally, I mean, depending where you live, but if you live in London or in Paris or in New York, I mean, the traffic is absolutely different than the traffic you have here, because the traffic you have in those Middle East new cities is quite new because the cities are new and you enjoy better traffic. So it's something which is absolutely essential to be considered for the future of designing well, Let's cities. talk about mobility. Laurent, I know you want to come in, but I just want to check with David because you are having to make certain assumptions about technology when it comes to mobility. And it, we are in a kingdom where most people are slaves to the car. 
or wheels of some kind. Is that something in your view, planning as you are at the moment, which is going to continue in a, in a nation like the KSA? Okay, so that's a great question. So at the moment, you're absolutely right, people are dependent on the vehicle at the moment. So you look at our communities and we're trying to um, bring down the scale of traffic and the speed of traffic. So to make them more pedestrian friendly, we're also trying to encourage people to leave their cars and appreciate in the climate, depends where you are in the kingdom, it's not always possible to do that, not every day of the year, but we're bringing micro mobility in. So we're bringing e-scooters, e-bikes, we're, we're, um, all our homes have got EV charging points or access to EV charging. So we're trying to plan for the future because we recognize that manufacturers will not be making petrol cars in the next five to 10 years. But do people own their own vehicle or do they access a community vehicle or At the community moment, wheels? So that's another great question. At the moment, I think it's pretty popular that people own their own vehicle. Um, they take a bank loan or buy it themselves and th that's how they get their vehicle. So in terms of um, mobility and actually encouraging people for car share schemes, um, you, people in the kingdom will see Roshan.com as a platform soon where you can get your rental car from and I can vision and that's what we're planning for where actually it's an on-demand service. So if you want a car, it, it can be delivered to your front door as an EV charging, a chargeable car. So we're trying to plan for that. We don't want communities with cables running everywhere in five years' time. That would be a disaster. You may be able to call up a drone quite soon as well, maybe, judging by one conversation that. I've had here. But Laurent, you wanted to come in. I'm sorry I had to de delay you, but you had a particular point. No, I think technology will play a, a key role also in the urban planning because before you plan and you take the decision, you need to simulate the impact. And we have now uh, a, t a technological tool, which is the digital twin. We can replicate digitally what, this, what does it look like and simulate the creation of a new infrastructure, the creation of a new district of the city and see the impact it will have on the gas emissions, for instance, but also on the all organization uh, of the city before, you know, the politicians or uh, the, uh, the, the private companies, they take the decision to build uh, a building or to build an infrastructure. So technology will be key uh, for urban planning of the future. Do you think people are prepared to be radical enough to realize the kind of concept which will be needed for these cities of the future. The future is only a few years away rather than 100 years away. Well, I think, you know, the, the uh, uh, climate disasters that we all experienced, not only in the developing world, but also in the, in the developed world uh, during this summer, made everybody aware that uh, the behaviors needed to change. And uh, a lot of cities have taken some, uh, I would say, concrete measures like low emission zones, smart, pa smart parking regulations, which lead to a decrease, a sharp decrease in the use of cars. If you take the city of Stockholm or the city of Milan, with these legislations, the number of cars in the cities have decreased by 40%. Barry. I was thinking about uh, 100 years from now, and I was thinking about Europe, where many of the cities have many buildings that were built 100 years ago. And, and what's required, what has happened, is the retrofit and renovation of these properties. And that Dar es Salaam will be a city of 88 million, but New York will never be 88 million. And the existing cities that are, don't have the growth rates of some of the African or, or, or um, Asian cities, you know, they, they're going to be faced with a challenge to renovate and retrofit buildings that actually don't work in, in the new, in the, in the new, what the future holds for. So especially as the shift may be permanent in some places, the work from home phenomenon. So you might see a lot of older office buildings like cities in New York City become residential and maybe they'll become affordable housing, which all the cities need. Um, master plan, you'll need, you'll need the governments to work with the cities and governors to provide tax credits and other incentives to actually retrofit the existing stock because some of it's historical and people want the character of these buildings, but they don't want the insides of these buildings. And I, I think the... Um, and the quality of mass transit, which serves twofold, it eliminates street level retail, allows you to open up the street grade for activities and shops and, and, and restaurants and social activities. Those are the things that bring people back into the city. And if you can get the cars off the streets, which obviously serves a lot of environmental uh, concerns, even if it's electric, it still needs gas to produce the energy to run the car. So the quality of what's built in the infrastructure will dictate the future of these cities and how successful they will be and how they grow. And it's, um, it's a very interesting and fascinating time for people to think more long-term, particularly in short-term thinking nations like the one I come from, the States, which is used to working week to week and quarter to quarter. 
I mean, this is long-term planning by responsible people with a vision, a plan, and an open architecture so everyone understands what we're trying to achieve so you build a better city, a livable and sustainable city. You don't want everyone to leave the CBD, the Central Business District, and go out to the suburbs. You want to make the city vibrant and vibrant. And you see the mistakes. You see the Houstons, which have no walking downtown and 30% vacancy rates. You can see what doesn't work. And you can see what does work on a, on a global basis. One of the interesting concepts going around is the 15-minute city, where everything can be done within 15 minutes, Sounds the good way you me. live and sleep. So I, leave that, I leave that on the agenda. Mohammed, do you have a master concept in your mind, not for 100 years, but for five or 10 years, about where you think you are going with your designs and your concepts, not just high-rise stuff, but actually in a different way? Are you already ahead of the curve on this? Well, I don't know about ahead of the curve, but of course, we, on le the curve. we, we, we learn from so many people. Um, our recent uh, development in, in Albania, for example, for, for about uh, 40,000 inhabitants on the coastline, what we're deploying, and we, we know the basic, we know sustainability, we know traffic, we know social needs, art, uh, green space, we know all that. But the amazing thing now is that you've got these great companies that work with most mayors in the city, and I hope my colleagues in Saudi Arabia, they work with them. And these companies, they buy data from the telcos, they buy ev mo some of the interesting data from iPhone, and they understand human need in that city during the summer, during the winter, social needs, living needs, work needs, to a point where in some of our development, actually, the data is saying, don't build any more kitchens. In this neighborhood, they all use food delivery, and the growth of food delivery in the city is moving you know, 3% a month. Most probably, in about five years' time, there's no need for kitchen, so units will be smaller, it will be more efficient, and the same thing about walkable cities. I mean, the amount of data is out there with telcos and with specialized data companies, I really believe we lean on it. There is so much to learn that we plan much, much better. But for now, we design everything in line with, can we keep you at home? You work, you shop, you entertain, you listen to your music, don't drive a car, don't go very far, no pollution, no you know, sustainability issues are taken care of. But at the same time, we want you to live a good life, Nick besides sustainability and all that, but can we, ha can we help you live a beautiful life that you don't have to suffer every day having 25 minutes or one hour you know, uh, commuting as well? So that's very critical for us. This question is driven by one other phrase I've heard um, discussing cities about we want cities, not human swamps, particularly when you build on what you're seeing coming down the track in some of the developing nations. What is, your, what is your view, um, uh, Hakan, about, about the pressure on sewages, sewage, water, resources, and whether the cities can cope? We're going from 50% of the world in cities to 75% of the world in cities. Can cities provide what people expect of them when they arrive, even if they're pushed in a kind of migration curve? If we design it right, we can. Um, we need to change our focus from the old view of let me build a product and go sell it to really understanding what the people will need in the cities and design for it. People ask for solutions, comfort, service. And if you can, the old school design industrial work would be designing a product and going and selling it. Now the new focus is designing products connecting seamlessly your cloud platforms, making it intelligence automated so that you can provide a solution uh, to your customers. If we design this user-centric um, approach, then we can be successful. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, the old school way, let's say take this bottle. As an engineer, I can design this bottle, very nice. I can go and sell it for a dollar per piece, a commodity business. But you create a lot of waste with this bottle. The customer wants water, not the bottle. The new way of thinking is what we're trying to apply is instead of building this bottle, I can pour this water into a fancy glass, put a piece of lime in it, bring it to you as a service. Instead of a dollar, I charge you $5 plus tip for my service with water. You're happy as a customer because I'm solving your problem. That's thirst. I'm not creating waste. Plus, I can put an intelligent sensor into the glass. 
I can get the feedback and see when your glass is empty, I can come back and refill it. That becomes a recurring revenue solution, not more than what you need. It's absolutely what you need, when you need it, and customized for you. If we design our cities, products, and solutions with sufficient um, to, to satisfy the needs of the consumers and the people, I think this is a win-win for everyone. Laurent, let me pick up with you on the engineering side. And I've mentioned sewage and water and those kind of basic facilities. Do you, f do you see real stress there, in addition to which there's the climate emergency, where many cities are discovering they're built in the wrong places anyway? In other words, is there going to be a crunch coming, which is already being exacerbated by the climate problems and the shortages of basic services and just the ability to get rid of muck and provide water? I think uh, the engineer is uh, now in a very uh, interesting situation because uh, uh, he is the one who can solve this paradox. Uh, two millions uh, more in the cities uh, will, of course, lead to more infrastructure, more buildings, so more gas emissions and more problems like the ones you've just, uh, you've just uh, talked about. And at the same time, all the cities are taking commitments to reduce their gas emissions. So the engineers uh, are at the center to create uh, the, the, to conceive the buildings and the infrastructure, which will, of course, lead to, uh, uh, of course, create more infrastructure, but creating l fewer problems uh, and solve the ones you, 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 you've just talked about. Well, David, how are, you, how are you coping with this within the kingdom when it comes certainly to water and the, the basics, which people take for granted? There'll be a tap, they'll, they can use their WC, et cetera, et cetera but actually you've, that requires a significant amount of engineering capacity to handle what people expect. Yes, indeed. Let, let's just talk about the walkable city, first of all. It was mentioned by one of my colleagues a moment ago. So all our cities, all our suburbs are designed around the ability of the five to 10 minute walk. So the local mosque, Juma mosque, local kindergarten, local school, everything is in a, a very short distance from the front door. So that's important. In terms of water, water is a rare commodity as we know. It uh, depends on where you are in the kingdom. Um, Jeddah has more rainfall and we're developing in Jeddah. But if you're talking about Riyadh, um, almost all the water comes from desalination. So it's a, it's a rare commodity. We are taking, we're um, capturing that wastewater. We're pushing it back through our own sewage treatment plants on site. And then we're recycling that water and then sending it back to irrigate all the greenscape within the master plan. So we're trying to make it work hard a few times rather than wasting it and just um, have it go down the drains. All right, we've got six minutes left and there are six of you on the panel. So you each have a minute now to try and summarize what you see as the picture. I, I have a problem with 100 years from now, but let's say 20 or 30 years to be generous. But the picture of what kind of developments there will be, certainly in the modern city design, but also keep coping with the legacy city about how that is handled with the enormous pressure on it. John Tote. I mean, you have to two levels. You have the emerging world, which is uh, completely different to the developed world. So you need to address that. And the problems are completely different between one to the other one. And uh, in the emerging world, clearly they are 50 years behind, about from now. So what we could expect that they are at the level where modern world is now. That is the challenge. And uh, then in the modern world, clearly it will be a revolution which has started. Why we are electric cars by, in Europe by 2035, electric cars will be compulsory. So that's just a game changer. All right, thank you, John. Mohamed. I don't really worry about uh, countries that have resources. I think they will sort it out. My worry is the countries that don't have resources and that need um, assistance and help. And that is, I think that's really, it worries me because, you know, I just opened a, a new institute now for, for value housing, uh, for global collaboration for value housing, for example. But when it comes to these countries, these countries need support. Now, they have to be willing to accept that support. And I think there is a global duty that we can't leave that world alone because at the end of the day, it's, it's part of little, this little planet and will be affected by it. And that worries me. Are you talking about help to think more imaginatively and more radically? Well, uh, to put policies, to fund, and that the fund have to be utilized properly, you know what I mean? That is really a big challenge. I think the world have to, have to, have, have to hug this thing now. 
because as, as you rightly said, planning have to start now. Okay. So two things are really important. Um, one is working on these mega cities is really exciting. It is really fun because you can really shape the future in these cities, learn from it. But uh, don't you find it also frightening to think of the numbers now? It is really frightening because as I mentioned, it's technology's evolution. Expectations and technology evolve together. If you design the cities, buildings, architectures too rigid, evolution doesn't like rigidity. Eventually, you will become obsolete. So we need to design with flexibility, with agility, with seamless connectivity, digital twins on the cloud, so we can connect and upgrade our systems and software to the customer's needs. Um, and I think these cities will be great learning locations, more like living labs. Um, the biggest challenge will be not only those mega cities that we're building from scratch, where we are living today, the aging infrastructure. How do we bring those learnings and innovations back to the existing cities and infrastructure and upgrading those? Because this is where the waste is today. David, I'm going to come in here. How much are you being nimble and agile and adapting all the time because of exactly what Hawken has just said. In other words, not having something literally rigid now for 100 years from now. Well, I guess um, we're creating products which are relevant now and trying to future-proof as best we can for a few years ahead. I use the car analogy. Many of my work colleagues know I use this a lot, which is about continual evolution. So we have a product which is fine now, fit for purpose. It won't be fit for purpose in a couple of years' time. So we need to keep learning, continual learning, getting feedback from our customers, and then, re then recognizing how to make those products the best we possibly can. So I'm, com I'm confident we can do that in Saudi. It, supply chain is a big challenge for everybody in real estate at the moment and many other industries. So we've got to get over that hurdle. But practically, we can do this. I think the, the biggest challenge for me to, that this is really going to be successful is the community because you can build a lot of real estate and it's a, not a nice place to be, it's not attractive, no one wants to be there. Why do we want to be in a community? Because we want to be with other people. And I think if we get that right, that's probably our biggest challenge, is to get the community to function in the way that my Saudi colleagues here want in terms of how they want to live in the future. Barry, your big idea. Uh, you know, I was thinking of great cities of old that have survived and prospered, like Paris. Paris was laid out by a city planner on a grid, parks, uh, the river, the crossings, the museums. And today you have that opportunity in an emerging world, but you don't have that opportunity in cities like Cairo or Athens. You know, I, I, it is an issue of resources, but leadership and also best practices. You're gonna see cities that retrofit really well and adapt their technologies and do smart tax incentives to and cities that, that will struggle, well, they sh in the U.S. we have the mayor, the uh, mayor councils. The, they, there's a head of the mayor's, actually Mayor Suarez, who was here from Miami, is the head of the U.S. Cities, um, city mayor councils. And they get together and they should share best practices. This should be a global best practice because there's no difference between the, the, the situations that we'll tackle in a city like Cleveland, which needs to renovate itself, and some of the cities uh, uh, existing all over the world. It's a, it's an incredible challenge, an incredible opportunity, and there's a lot of learnings that could happen from meetings like this where we talk about topics like this. All right, Laurent, I come back to you. I mean, he's just mentioned Paris. Paris is wonderful in the center, but the Montlieu keep the suburbs keep <laughs> moving out and moving out without control. What's your big idea or big thought about where we're going and the dangers ahead, quickly? Well, I think our responsibility is to, from now on, have a human-centric approach uh, towards uh, mega cities, which means uh, for the developing world, uh, build resilient mega cities, and for the uh, developed world, uh, the key uh, challenges are the, sustain the sustainability, the digitalization of these cities, but also uh, the fact to associate the people uh, to the governance and to the decision making. I think for uh, the changes to, to be ac uh, accepted by the people, they need to take part in the decision-making process, which uh, is not the case everywhere That's in crucial. the world. Yeah, uh, and the red light is on, but yeah, for you, I Mohammed, just, I just want to say it. something close to my heart. If the world were to save the money spent the past 10 years on conflict, we will have no subject to talk about in this meeting about how to solve 
how to build great cities 100 years from today if it's in Lagos or anywhere else. And it's a shame that we are such intelligent people and in 10 years, trillions go to waste and now we have to sit down here and talk about the challenge. It, you know, it, makes, me, it makes me sad, but I still have some hope. New realities have been created though yeah, yeah. this year. Gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. We hope we've given you some portrait of what a city is going to be like in a few years' time, let alone 21, 22. None of us will be here unless you know something that we don't know and you've got a, uh, an endurance drug which is going to keep you here to check what the cities are going to be like in 100 years from now. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.